This episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast, is brought to you in partnership with Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher's cell therapy processing instruments are designed to help customers transition from process development to commercial manufacturing, utilized as standalone devices or integrated as part of a closed modular process. Thermo Fisher Scientific recommends Gibco CTS DynaSelect Magnetic Separation System, which is a next gen cell isolation and activation instrument. Gibco CTS Xenon Electroporation System allows customers full control to optimize for a variety of cell types and payloads. And Gibco CTS Rotea Counterflow Centrifugation System is a closed cell processing system supporting a broad range of protocols for cell separation, washing, and concentration. Customers can rely on and streamline their drug development process with Applied Biosystems Qualtrac qPCR and dPCR quality control tools for robust and reliable genetic analysis across various phases of drug development, supported by relevant, compliant documentation. Hello, listeners, and welcome to this episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Harris, and my guest for this episode is Ramesh Sumeranian, CEO of Asidian Therapeutics, a biotech focused on rewriting RNA. Ramesh, welcome to Cell and Gene, the podcast. Thank you for your time today. Hi, Aaron. Great to be here with you and your audience. Great podcast, and uh, I've always loved listening to it, and great to be a part of it. Oh, thank you for those kind words, and we're thrilled you're here with us, so this is great. Uh, all right, so... I gave a very brief explanation of Asidian, but I'd love for you to detail it for us more. So talk us through Asidian Therapeutics. What are you guys up to? So at Asidian Therapeutics, we are rewriting RNA and thereby addressing the genetic cause of disease. And we were launched by Apple Tree Partners, which is a fantastic venture capital fund in 2020 with uh, like 50 million in a Series A. And what we did with that money and with our founding chair, Mike Ehlers, who's just a phenomenal scientist, is develop this platform of RNA exon editing. So with this RNA exon editing, we have the capacity to correct genetic mutations. And one question that we always get is, what is, why did you name it Acidian Therapeutics, right? So we were truly inspired by nature because about two decades ago, people found that these sea creatures called ascidians actually re-engineer their complete transcriptome as they develop from a larva to an adult. And we are using a very similar process to rewrite RNA in larger organisms, right? And ultimately, hopefully humans. And so therefore, we're called ascidian therapeutics. We're based in Boston at a fantastic place called Boston Landing. 35 fun-loving scientists with us. And uh, every day is awesome. Well, that's great. And a really fun fact about uh, the sea creature aspect of the the background of your name and very, very, very cool. Um, so we you obviously mentioned RNA exon editing, and that's what I want to get into next. Talk us through what is RNA exon editing? So RNA exon editing is a process by which we re remove and replace multiple whole exons at the RNA level. And we do this with a single molecule and without any exogenous enzymes. So where would this apply? So if you have genes that are really too large to fit into say an AAB capsid to correct genetic mutations, or if you have genes that have tremendous number of mutations that lead to disease, the current therapies really allow you to only tackle maybe one mutation or a couple of mutations, but many patients are left out. So at Acidian, we are really unifying the therapy for a broader number of patients. So if we have a mutation in exon one, exon five, exon seven in different patients, but they all have the same disease, another company would have to develop single medicine for each of those mutations we can excise contiguous stretches of exons. For example, our lead program, we remove 22 exons at one time and replace it with 22 wild type exons. So whereas you might've heard of base editing which is talking about a single base or CRISPR with small stretches, 
we are changing the transcriptome in large chunks almost. And thereby we can address large number of patients with one single therapeutic. That's the beauty of our technology. And that's been optimized over the last two years, the great team here in Boston. And now we are heading towards IND with our first therapeutic. Nice. Okay. And we will definitely get that, get into that in a little bit, but I do want to talk about the potential of RNA exon editing in that. So we know that through Ascidian, you have, you are able to impact more patients. Broadly speaking, what is, and talk us through the potential of RNA exon editing in the entire field. Like, where are we at? Yeah, so as you know, RNA has got a tremendous amount of recognition. And I've been in the field a couple of decades, and we are the whole field is so excited to see the investments coming into RNA technologies. And the pandemic really brought us to the forefront of the mRNA therapeutics. Now, with Ascidian and RNA exon editing, we have the potential to rewrite the entire transcriptome, right? This will enable us to expand the potential of RNA medicines for patients who are truly awaiting, awaiting breakthroughs. So when you think about what we could do with exon editing, we could take it and replace, as we are doing now in ABCA4, mutant exons with the wild type exons. So the patient can now make those proteins of choice that are functional, that bring benefit to them and now help them lead a normal life. In other cases, there's genetic um, validation for a mutation that provides a benefit for an individual. We can actually put in those kind of mutated uh, RNAs, which are natural mutations for recurrent people, and thereby help them get around certain diseases or maybe never have that disease. And ultimately, we could, um, we're not there yet. For example, in oncology, we could disrupt RNA of certain toxic genes. So the potential and the breadth of RNA exon editing is vast. Mm -hmm. But we at the company are extremely focused today to replace mutated exons with wild type exons and thereby produce this protein of benefit. So the potential for us is not only to address autosomal recessive diseases, but now we can even look at autosomal dominant diseases and where the technology you, you could say, what is your sweet spot, right? So any gene that is too large to fit into an AV capsid, any gene that has a high mutational variance, such as an ABCA4 and certain other CNS diseases, any gene that requires what we call very fine-tuned dosage. And by that, I mean, there are certain genes wherein if you have too little of a particular protein, you have the disease. And if you use a gene therapy and overexpress that protein, now you have toxicity. Mm -hmm. So that expression needs to be finely tuned. Our technology enables the cell to tune its own protein expression when we re rewrite RNA. And this is a key point of our technology because we bind into what we call, or you know, as the pre-messenger RNA. And the cell controls how much pre-messenger RNA it makes. So the substrate that we have is limited by the cell. And once we have a certain amount of pre-mRNA, we edit those exons and make the protein that the cell decides it wants. So thereby we are never overexpressing. So those kind of targets are, are there are a tremendous number of them in the CNS. So we are working on those targets as well and moving those to the clinic. So the potential is quite broad, um, but we, again, try to remain focused. Good, good. Uh, that's actually what I want to talk about next in terms of your, we've mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I want to get uh, talk a little bit about it more, which is your pipeline. And as I understand it, you have current programs in ophthalmology and neurological and neuromuscular disorders and rare diseases. So talk us through your pipeline. What are you working on? What, what phase are we in? All of that. Sure. So I'll start with our lead program. So Ascidian's lead program targets the ABCA4 gene, where mutations are responsible for progressive form of blindness, such as Stargardt's disease. 
So researchers have identified more than 900 individual mutations in this particular gene. And it's across many different patients. So therefore, a single base edit approach is not a great fit. While full gene replacement would take care of any of these mutations, the gene is too large. It's about close to seven kilobases. So it doesn't fit into an AAV vector very well either. But by packaging those exons that are mutated and replacing them, we can provide benefit for ABCA4 patients. And this is critical because for these patients, they have a disease of the macula. So they have central vision that deteriorates over time and ultimately leads to blindness. There are currently no therapies in the market. Our therapeutic would address about 60% of the patient mutations um, for this disease. And there are approximately 100,000 patients worldwide. So a large number of patients who are suffering from the disease that we hope to benefit is our lead uh, indication. And that molecule is right now in IND enabling studies. So we are getting towards the clinic. We've um, talked to the regulatory authorities and had great feedback that reads through our entire platform. And we believe with our technology, we can truly provide benefit for these patients, especially since we are editing RNA and not DNA. So that's our lead program. It's an inocular therapeutic. Um, the subsequent programs, we have a couple of programs in ocular other diseases, as well as a number in uh, CNS, neuro, neurology space and neuromuscular indications. Those have demonstrated great, <clears throat> excuse me, RNA editing, as well as protein production. And those are going into pharmacology models to demonstrate that they can actually be effective and change a phenotype. Once we get to that stage, of course, we'll advance them towards an IND as soon as possible. But there are tremendous or uh, high unmet need in all of those CNS diseases. And we hope to get those patient, uh, drugs to patients as soon as possible. Uh, they also have a great discovery team. So we have a whole track of uh, discovery targets that we focus on um, to date. Fortunately or unfortunately, we have not been able to meet a cell line that we are a disease where we cannot actually exon edit and provide some benefit. And so our challenge is always, what do we work on and what do we not work on? So we have a, currently a wealth of targets and data. And the way we look at it at Ascidian is we want to help patients with a few internal programs, as well as partner with others to develop some of our pipeline programs. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for all that detail too, that's great. Um, I want to talk about the difference between RNA exon editing and gene editing. We do cover both quite a bit on cell and gene, but I would love to hear from you the breakdown between the two. Yes, so DNA editing is a, a superb technology and there've been a number of companies that have developed it and some are taking it into the clinic. Um, we at the city are developing, as you mentioned, RNA exon editing technology. We do believe it has significant advantages because we are editing RNA and not DNA. And thereby we believe we maintain the genome integrity mm. because if you think of DNA editing as you know digital, where there's two copies and you've got to edit both at a very high efficiency rates, RNA is much more forgiving you have an, a plethora of messenger RNA that you have and you can edit. At the same time, it, sufficient mRNA editing provides a protein that's beneficial to patients ultimately. So you have a lot more flexibility in editing RNA and a lot more room for, um, for actually developing the therapeutic. So thinking of it that way, RNA exon editing we believe is a inherently safer way to develop a therapeutic. Also, this RNA degrades. It doesn't remain over time. So thereby, if there is a misedit, it is degraded over time. And thereby, we should not have any long-term effects. Some other parts that we think about is we edit without a foreign enzyme. We actually harness the endogenous cells splicing machinery to do all the action and replace the mutated exons with our wild type exons. 
thereby we're not introducing any foreign enzymes, which means we reduce the risk of immunogenicity when we put our molecules into patients. That's to be proven, of course. That's what we believe and that's what we've seen in primates. So all those factors together, we feel positions RNA editing very well and hopefully can be tremendously beneficial to patients. Good, okay. Um, one final question. Uh, in addition to everything we've covered here today, what is the one thing you want Selenjean the podcast listeners to walk away from this episode, better understanding about RNA exon editing? That's a great question. Um, so what I would, I think, uh, recapitulate what I'd said before, we are inspired by nature. We're using RNA exon editing as a natural process that occurs in chordates and now in vertebrates, and we are taking it to humans. So we do believe it's like RNAi. It's a very well-known mechanism within the cell and should be beneficial for patients ultimately. But we also have some distinct advantages. With the therapeutic, for example, ABCA4, we're delivering it with an AAV to the back of the eye, and we believe it'll have the durability of gene therapy, whereby we can have a one dose for a lifetime. Moreover, we have these five points that are, we believe, distinct advantages, advantages of RNA exon editing. We edit RNA, not DNA, so we're maintaining that genome integrity. We're editing whole exons, not single bases or small stretches, so we can cover a lot more mutations and help ultimately a lot more patients. We do not introduce a foreign enzyme, so thereby we believe we decrease that immunogenicity. We are agnostic to delivery, so we're exploring both viral and non-viral deliveries to get our molecule to the right target tissue. And then last but not least, we maintain with our technology the na native gene expression patterns and levels. So all those together combine to keep us really excited, working really hard for patients and developing our technology and getting it to the clinic. Perfect, thank you. That's an excellent response to that question. So I appreciate you giving it the thought that you did. Um, so we've reached the formal end of our episode. And uh, as you know, at the end of all of my episodes, I like to ask my guests uh, a question to get to know who they are when they're not out, when they're not at, in the lab or in the office. And so since you are in Cambridge, right? I well, wanted to- Right across Boston, the river. Right across the river, Boston. Um, yes, that's right. Uh, what is your favorite Boston, Cambridge area, but Boston, uh, eatery? And here's why I'm asking. So a few years ago, my family and I, my husband and I, we took our kids to, this is pre-COVID, to Boston. They were still, they're still young, but they were even younger then. Um, and we were just on the hunt for anywhere that sold chicken nuggets, right? So it was a different experience. <laughs> It's a different experience. And we're thinking of going back this summer. And so selfishly, I'm looking for uh, their, their palates have improved slightly. So I'm wondering if you could share some of your favorite restaurants with me and the listeners. Well, I'm just thinking, what would I, where would I love to go from work and get a bite for lunch, for example, right? Right. Um, I love the Clover Food Labs. I don't know if you've been there, but you should take your kids there. Yeah. It's kind of a fast food place, but it started out as a food truck, right? Maybe 15 years ago. And now they morphed into a few pop-up um, spots that are now more permanent, but they've got local organic food. That's really tasty. They've got a changing menu that's seasonal and the utensils are really compostable. And oh, so they're nice. really environmentally friendly as well. And it's delicious food. And I'm always surprised when I go there because sometimes I won't taste a particular vegetable. I won't want one, but I try it with them. And then I want to know the menu, the recipe and try and make it at home. And so it's a great place to go. I would certainly recommend it. The kids will find something for them, for them to let, eat. Well, thank you. That's very helpful. I love that. Could you repeat the name again? Clover. Clover Food Labs. Okay. I love yeah. the whole concept too. The local local right. goods and the compostable um, exactly. utensils. Exactly. And seasonal. Yep. Yeah. 
all kinds of root vegetables, um, other favorite chickpeas. And uh, so it's, yeah. it's delicious. You should try it. All right. Well, I'm sold. So thank you. <laughs> all right, listeners, we are all set here. That Thanks again to Asidian Therapeutics, Ramesh Sumeranian. Ramesh, this was a lot of fun. Thank you for all of your time and the great insight you shared with us today. Good. Thank you, Aaron. Have a great day. Please. You too. Please visit CellandGene.com, subscribe to Cell and Gene, the podcast, as well as our newsletter, and follow us on social media. And we'll talk to you soon.